So there, you might have noticed there's a slight change in schedule, maybe a little bit, I don't know. And I really try to like, set up a timer now, which I could have done beforehand. But hey, this is impromptu, so you have to deal with this now. Um, excellent. My computer decided to go to sleep. That's smashing. Seems he's not the only one right now. OK, so uh, 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 no, that's not true. No. Yes, that looks more like it. Uh, just to clarify, that was totally part of the performance. Uh, very much planned. So how's everyone doing? No, 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 no. How's everyone doing? All right. OK. So my name is Martin Splitz. Uh, I am from Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, where it's pretty warm right now, which is not that usual for other parts of the year. Um, and I'm really happy to be here because it's even warmer and even more sunny and even nicer. Um, I am a webmaster's trans analyst at Google. And when I say that, people are like, aha. Right? And it's the same kind of aha as if a quantum physicist says, yes, uh, our world is basically a nine-dimensional thing floating through a seven-dimensional space in quantum foam. And you're like, aha, right? So I'd rather say, screw that. I'm a developer avocado uh, at Google. So I'm here to help you be more successful. Um, the developer avocado movement uh, comes from Sara Viega uh, from Portugal. Thank you very much for that. Follow her on Twitter. She's pretty awesome. Um, and before we begin, I planned this talk to be the last talk of the day. Now, life has happened, or as uh, Ashley said on one of her slides, shit has happened. So anyways, I'm going to do a little recap of what we saw yesterday. So we were very sciencey yesterday, very precise. As a German, I very much like that, right? It's like very exact science here. Um, we had someone quoting, someone quoting, someone <laughs> who was speaking here. So now if you take a picture of this, I can use that in a follow-up presentation. So please take a picture and tweet this. Because I think we are onto something here. <laughs> blockchain has nothing on us, right? This is our blockchain. Cool. And we got our expectations ramped up, and uh, we can now demand for better stuff on the web, and we should be part of making the web better. And I very much second that opinion. Uh, there's a little disclaimer, because, you know, I work for a large company, so I have to do a disclaimer. No, I, actually, I do not. but. Like, my boss was like, you cannot, you just don't have to do this. I'm like, I want to. So um, the disclaimer is, I'm not part of the Angular team, and I haven't done that much Angular development in quite a while, so please be gentle with me. Most of the tips work across frameworks and even in vanilla JavaScript. Uh, no animals were harmed in this presentation. It's absolutely vegan. It's actually also gluten-free, but it might contain traces of nuts, which is a pun, if you haven't noticed, because I'm nuts, kind of, I guess. Uh, also, consult your fellow developers and friendly people in this community. You should talk to people you haven't met before, because that's what conferences are really good at, um, uh, if you see any adverse effects. OK. With that out of the way, I have a problem. Or so some people say. I have so many cute pictures of doggos and poppers that I don't know what to do with them. Now, I like to say this. So this is what people might think about it. But I like to say this is not a problem. This is an opportunity. And I think I'm on to the next big thing. Like, forget Uber and forget, like, Facebook and stuff. Uh, I'll make a doggo and papa rating website and become filthy rich. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, and I guess I can just get going, and I can just, you know, put some HTML together and uh, have some backend that serves my doc pictures and papa pictures and, like, serves the, serves the form and allows you to rate things. So I put this together, and here you have it. This is my website, basically. If you put it on a browser, then it actually looks like something nice. I now need to buy a domain, and then I'm pretty much settled, right? No. So I put up my website, doggosrating.com, and I wait. And I install an analytics tool of my choosing uh, from a company I might know. And, um, and no one comes, and no one clicks on the doggo picture. So like, 
the doggos are sad and the puppers are sad and you don't want sad puppers, right? Because no one's rating them, but they're all good boys and girls, so they deserve a rating, right? And I'm not making tons of money from ads, so that's also not very good. So what can I do? Well, conveniently, there is something that might help me, which is my little friend here, Googlebot. A lot of people are searching for stuff, and I'm pretty sure at least once a day, I, I don't know about you, but at least if I wake up, I'm like, oh, Google.com, cute puppers. Because you want to have a good start in this, in this world, right? You want to have a good start into the day, so you're searching for puppers, and uh, then you find some, hopefully. And I have, I think, the best doggos and puppers, so I think I should be found too. And that's cool because Googlebot does this for me. And Googlebot does this in two steps. It does crawling and it does indexing. Again, it's like the quantum foam thing where you're like, aha. So let's have a look at what that means. So basically, we start off with a bunch of websites that we happen to know, and we basically point a browser to it. So Googlebot is nothing else than a program that uses a browser to go to websites. All right, OK, cool. So it goes to those websites, um, and then it is extracts the content that is in there. So what is this website about? What does this website contain? And then it sends that to an index. So we can now basically, it's a little like in a library. In a library, you might find yourself going, uh, so I'm looking for books on dogs, or maybe cats for a change, right? Who here is a dog person? That's not enough. Um, <laughs> the rest of you have probably just like, you know, you, it was a great party yesterday, so you're like, oh, I want to raise my arm, but I can't. Um, it's, it's fine. I understand that. So we extract the content, and then in the library, you might go like, I want a book for cats. And then you look into the index, and it says, these books uh, contain things about cats. And then you can go to this book and read the book and have a good time. Cool. And we're doing pretty much the same thing just for websites. So we figure out, aha, so this website contains information about this. So we notice, that we, like, we make a mark on that, and we're like, OK, yeah, this website contains this stuff. That's cool. And then if someone asks us for it, we're like, oh, wait, what do we have here? So we have this website, and we have that website so that we give you things that actually make sense. If you are looking for dogs and you find a website about cats, that's not a good result. So that's the indexing step. And during indexing, we might find out, oh, wait, this page also links to these other pages. So we send that back to the Googlebot, and Googlebot goes and, and crawls these pages and figures out what they, they are about and then actually gives that to the index. And then this cycle goes on and on and on. Cool. So how does that look like in practice? So the crawler has found my website, uh, which looks like this. And now we go for the indexing bits. And the indexing bits go, aha. So this is the biggest rating platform for doggos and puppers, obviously. And um, it has the latest doggo, which seems to be a dog named Laika, apparently. Because you know, like there's this alt tag that says Laika, and the image is called Laika PNG. That's a good hint that this might be a dog called Laika. And it is the latest dog. So if I'm searching like, for latest dog on doggos rating, then maybe a good result would be Leica, which apparently has more information here. So we probably want to have a look at that link later. But there are more doggos and more puppers as depicted down here. So we want to have a look at that later as well. So this, this should be crawled, right? These three URLs that we've seen here should be crawled later on uh, because they cont might contain more information that might be relevant for certain things. So we are looking at these and go like, all right, yes, OK, cool, we, we found something. And this goes back to crawling. So then what we have is like we have our website that contains doggos and puppers rating and is apparently the biggest platform for doggos and puppers rating. So if it's like biggest doggos and puppers platform or biggest doggos and puppers website, then maybe this website is a good thing. Maybe not. We don't know yet. But you know, we can try at least and ask a few users and show it to users and say, like, does this look good? And then you can tell us, no, no, this doesn't look good. And we're like, oh, dang. OK, then we have to fix this. But now we know that we have, like, this website points to a bunch of other things, like the dog named Laika, uh, more doggos, and more puppers. And then we can crawl these. And then the cycle continues. However, this is pretty good, right? So now our website is indexed. So if someone says cute doggos or cute puppers, or even goes for, like, Laika, doggo, then we might find our website. So now our dogs get ratings. Googlebot is happy. I'm happy. The doggos and puppers are happy. Everyone's happy. That's pretty good. Cool. However, um, I'm, before I continue, I'm picking Angular as an example. The things we're going to talk about are as relevant for pretty much every other client-side framework. 
OK. So don't, don't like, oh, Angular. Oh. Which is kind of weird, because last year I was here when it was still called Angular Camp, and I had a talk that had nothing to do with Angular. And this year it's like, no, 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 we're not focusing on Angular anymore. Now it's JavaScript Camp. I'm like, cool, I'm going to do an Angular talk. <laughs> because timing is my middle name. <laughs> anyway, so um, you might do websites differently these days. At least I do. I do not start with like, writing HTML necessarily, especially if I want to build a single page application or a progressive web app. I might start with something else. I might do, you know, I have Angular installed, so why not? ng new doggos rating, and I get a new bootstrap Angular app. Cool. And then I do ng surf, which gives me a local development server so that I can see what I'm doing. And then I build my application and test it in the, in the development server and, and have a look at it. Ah, looks good. Test it across the browsers. Cool. Works in the Explorer. Nice. Um, all well done. Good job, Martin. And then I create the production build. So basically, I, I do all the things that we should be doing, like minification, concatenation, tree shaking, whatever. I do all that. And then I serve it, and it looks great. And my users are happy, and I'm happy, and I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. Um, but then I look into my analytics again, and I see, hmm, it's not that many people coming to my new website. That's weird. Why is that happening? Huh, it's, it's far less people coming from Google search. That's odd. And, um, and then I have a look at my, my source code, the thing that I serve when you first come to my website. And it looks like this. Now, can you tell me what this website is about just from looking at the source code? Hmm. I mean, the only relevant bit of HTML that is not a script tag is this. So I don't know, but I have a feeling Googlebot's not going to like this. Because, you know, Googlebot comes to my website, downloads my, 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 web, uh, my, my markup, my HTML, and then tries to figure out what my website is about. And in this case, it's like about app root. What is that? What does that mean? Huh. So how can we get that back? How can we get back to square one, where we serve something reasonable uh, also to crawlers? And this is, not the, like, this is not only Googlebot's problem, right? We, have, we are serving this to our users, so that means that we just had the talk from, from Johannes about this. That means that we are not getting the progressive parsing of HTML, which the browser is really good at. And we have to wait until our JavaScript is parsed, which can give this uncanny valley problem, right? The universal JavaScript uh, is one way of solving this. Um, another way of solving this is saying, hey, Googlebot, maybe do a little more work. I mean, I like you, and I respect you for who you are. But how about you also do some rendering for me? Wouldn't that be nice? And our mission at Google Search is to find and provide your content to users who are looking for it. We do not want you to do extra work. So we're like, of course, yes, let's teach Googlebot how to render things. Now, when I'm saying rendering, there's something tricky about this word rendering, because rendering is a bunch of stuff. Rendering starts when we use a template and put data in. That can happen on the server side or on the front end, right? If it would be an old-fashioned PHP application, for instance, then we would probably have a template and a database, and then the PHP script fetches data from the database, puts it into the HTML, and then serves that HTML to the browser. That's server side. But this, the same thing goes for what our Angular app does, and your React app probably does, and Vue uh, apps do. You have a template HTML. You have some JavaScript that fills it with data coming from somewhere. And that happens on the client side. It's the same thing, but it happens on the client side in this case. And then once we have the HTML markup and give that to the browser, the browser goes like, all right, cool. I'm going to construct a DOM tree. And then I'm going to do some layouting, figuring out where everything goes on the page. And then I create the pixels that you see on the screen. I'm not so concerned about the last bit. So we're going to focus, when I say rendering today, I know that I have talks, I've, I've given talks that were the other part of rendering. Today, I'm going to focus on this first part of the rendering story. So what we could be doing, or we want to be doing, is we crawl your page, get that URL out there, render it right away, then extract the content. Now that we have your JavaScript executed and your, your app has loaded, and so like all the images are there, all the texts are there, we extract the content, we index that, and then we put the next, you know, we discover links and URLs and images, and then we crawl those. And then we continue. That's what we want to do. And then we'd, I'd be like, cool, yeah, thank you very much for listening. It has been a great pleasure being here. Enjoy the rest of the conference. 
uh, please talk to me in the breaks. I'm around. You can find me on Twitter. Nah, 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 nah. But that's not quite what's happening now. So as it turns out, I was as surprised as you are. As I joined Google, I found out the internet is actually big. And the web is particularly big. So we see on average, or like this, this number is a little old, but we see approximately 160,000, 160, sorry, 160,000. <laughs> nice try. Add a few more zeros there. Uh, 160 trillion documents on the web, over. So like, th that's the absolute minimum number. It's definitely growing. So, um, and as it turns out, rendering costs resources. And you have to use you know, computers and stuff. And surprisingly enough, my MacBook isn't enough to do that. I was as shocked as you are. So it turns out we can't do this cycle in one go. So we said, yeah, OK. So we have to wait a little bit until we have the resources available to render all these documents regularly. Because the website might change. The website might go away. The website might add new information. It might fix something that wasn't quite right. But there's still a lot, of, a lot of websites that are giving us static HTML right away. And it would be not nice to have them wait. So we have to find another solution for those websites that are like giving us all the content in one go so that we can index it right away, and for those websites who don't. So we came up with the idea of doing it in two stages. So we get your content, we look at it, and we go like, ah, all right, there's not that much content here. Or even, oh, yeah, there is a lot of content here, but who knows? Maybe there's some dynamic content that we're not seeing yet. So we index what we get right away, which in my Angular application uh, example uh, from uh, earlier would be not much, to be honest. But we index it. We go like, yeah, we have a page here. We should render this later on. That's cool. Um, and then we, if it's like all is there, then cool, that's it, that we are done. And then later on, we might still render it and see if we get more from you. But in the case of my Doggos rating app, that's not a problem. It will show up in Google. It's just going to take a little longer because basically what's happening, the first stage of indexing goes, ah, OK, not much to see here. So I can't really, I don't know what people would be searching for to go here. So I'm not going to put much into the index yet. And then once the rendering becomes available and we render your page, that's when we then index again, and that's when I find out, aha, this is about dogs, and this is about puppers, and there's a dog called Laika, and that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, let's do this. And so basically, we have this two-stage uh, indexing process. But there's a way to, even if you're using um, front-end frameworks like Angular or React, to get into this first indexing stage. And it's called server-side rendering, or universal JavaScript, those two ways exist. Uh, there's a third way, which is like dynamic rendering, which is a weird hybrid. Um, you can do these things. And in, I want to show you a little example of how to do that with Angular, because I kind of like the story behind it. So when I was introduced to Angular Universal, I thought, OK, it makes a few assumptions. But if you happen to meet these assumptions, then it's quite smooth. Because I'll, all I have to do is, so I have my Angular app running. What you have to do then is you have to ng generate the universal app from it, with the client project Doggos rating in my case. Then I install the additional dependencies. And then I basically create a server. I create an Express app in this case. Um, and I say, hey, Express, when you try to render HTML, how about you use the ng Express engine and mount my application? Right? And then whenever someone comes and tries to like, get a, a, a static asset, like a JavaScript file or an image file, please serve that from the folder that I created when doing ng build. And if someone else comes with a regular request to one of my many routes, then please serve it using the index uh, um, HTML file. And then the HTML in engine is the Angular universal rendering engine. So now we are using server-side rendering. And then. I basically go forward and say, OK, so I do again a build prod so that I have all my assets ready and bundled. And, uh, and then I create my server. I use TypeScript for this because I'm using TypeScript anyways for my Angular application. Uh, and then once I have my server JS, I can just run that. And now, if Googlebot comes back to my page, it sees this. Yes! This has all the content. There's like great doggos, there's doggos, and then there's the doggo called Epona that has an image and is rated 10 of 10, which I think is an understatement. 
She should totally be a 12 out of 10, but okay, sure, you know, the populace has spoken, fine by me. So now we are back in the first wave of indexing, because Googlebot sees this and goes, ah, this is about doggos, and here's a dog called Epona, that's pretty cool. Hmm, that's not too bad. Sure, in many cases, this story will be a little more complicated, but, you know, if the stars align, then that's what you can do. And there's similar solutions for all the other frameworks. React has a server-side rendering story. Vue has a server-side rendering story. Nuxt makes it particularly easy. Um, Ember has a, has a server-side rendering story. So that's, that's possible. That's possible today, and that's pretty great. If you're using th things like Polymer or Web Components or Stencil.js, you can even put most of your content into the light DOM, which makes sense if you're using these things. And then we see that uh, right away, even though we need JavaScript to get the components to look right, that's still fine. Cool. Googlebot's happy again. My dogs are happy again. I'm happy again. Woo! That's pretty good. OK. So to not bore you anymore with framework-specific stuff, I want to leave you with a bunch of very simple to do, very general tips that you can apply for all your websites and web apps. OK? Let's start with URLs. So we kind of underestimate the meaning and the, the, um, the importance of good URLs. So our URLs are pretty much an API and also a human interface, because there's st still a bunch of people remember the, API, the URLs or bookmark them. And if you bookmark them or even add them to your home screen, if it's a PWA, then you shouldn't just like rip them away from, from people. The same goes for, for crawlers like Google, Google Bot or uh, Facebook Bot or Twitter Bot or uh, Bing or whatever. Mm. They are relying on your URLs to stay around. So good URLs don't go away. What else is good about URLs? So first things first, we have done a little bit of hacky stuff in the past. So we used hash-based routing. Hashes in the URL are technically fragment identifiers. They point to a specific part of the document, but not to a different document. So they are not meant to be used to get completely different content into the document. The content should always be there, and then we just jump to the different parts of the content. So Googlebot does not really know what to do with the, with the hash URLs. So here we are seeing, like, OK, cool, this is example.com, uh, and then there's this weird thing that we kind of ignore. There's an exception if you use hash bang. You're also, if there's an exclamation mark, you might remember like 2009 or something, Twitter did that, I think, or 2012 or something. Um, then we, we figure out, aha, so someone here is using like the JavaScript magic to make this happen, but please just use the JavaScript history API unless, unless you really, really cannot. If you really, really cannot, please refer to server-side rendering or dynamic rendering. Um, so that's, that's what your URL should look like, just like a slash and then whatever route you're having. Also, do not just randomly like, remove a URL and put it somewhere else. If you want to rename your routes, that is absolutely fine, but use proper redirect HTTP codes or JavaScript uh, client-side redirects. Let's actually talk about that for a second later. Also, if you remove content, tell so. There is a good reason 404 exists, and a 404 page is called a 404 page. Actually, I think that's, that deserves a little more detail. So if you want to move a page, and just like take it down from the old URL and put it up in a new URL. What happens for crawlers such as Googlebot is they're like, oh, oh no, this page is gone. All I know about this page is useless now because it's gone and probably not coming back. I mean, I keep it around for a while because maybe they are coming back, but um, okay, this, this page is gone. Oh, there's a new page. Ha, huh. I didn't know that existed. That's interesting. Well, hello, new page. Let's, let's, let's set up a new record for you, and let's see how you're doing, if you're relevant, if you're good, if you're trustworthy, if you're useful. So all this information about the usefulness and trust that people put into you, this page by linking to it and stuff is lost, unless, unless you use a redirect. And you can do that either, that's like three ways, but one I wouldn't do. So I'd say like either if you have control over the server, make it a server-side redirect. Use a 301 for permanent redirects or a 302 for temporary redirects. In this case, our, our Googlebot comes and says, oh, all right, this page has moved on to this other thing. So I can move this record with me. So yeah, this page is, is you know, this page was great, and now it's here, so it's the same page. So yeah, people trust it, this is good. This is good stuff, I know this. Right? I can show this to users without being embarrassed. Cool? So use redirects in these cases. 
Um, you can do that using the, the HTTP codes, or if you do not have control over the server side, you can also do like a document location.href and then redirect us this way, or even like window.location.godo or whatever. So you can use either JavaScript or HTTP redirects. You could use meta refresh, but nah, just don't. It's, it's a hassle. If you delete a page, if you want something to disappear, or if there is a URL that leads to nothing because someone deleted something or something like that, tell us and tell us not to index it. Um, you can tell us not to index a page by saying, hey, there's a meta tag in the HTML. Uh, it's called robots, and please do not index what is on this page. Please do one thing, I, uh, do not do one particular thing that I keep seeing, which is a few people went like, huh, I'm not exactly sure if this is a 404 page or not. So I'll put this on every page and then use JavaScript to remove it. Can you see a problem with this? OK, so we do two, two stages, right? In the first stage, we get your HTML and index it. And then later on, we might render it. But what happens when we get this in the HTML? So the first stage, we get the HTML and it says, do not index this page. And we're like, sorry, bye, OK, wow. Um, and we're never going to execute your JavaScript. Oops. It's not very good. So don't put that on every page and then use JavaScript to dynamically remove it. Bad idea, OK? Uh, the other thing is use meaningful markup. HTML has a bunch of tags, and they, that's the way it is for a reason. So what do I mean by that? Well, I, what I mean by that is that a lot of technology, crawlers and assistive technology and browsers rely on semantics. HTML is a semantic markup language. Uh, and that means, for instance, if you want to link to a specific page, use a link and a normal link. That's not a normal link, OK? And even worse, like if you use a span, it's like, no. Why? You're literally writing more characters. This is not a good idea. There's a link tag for a reason, OK? So please don't do this. Because what we're going to see is like, oh, there's an anchor called more puppies. But where is it going? Well, maybe an on-click handler, maybe something more obscure. Maybe, maybe the on-click handler doesn't actually go somewhere. We don't know. It's unclear at this point. So if you give us this instead, we're like, ah, there are more poppers at slash poppers. Cool, that's nice. I can do that. OK, so use actual HTML. It does not hurt you. Trust me, I've been there. OK, cool. The other thing is you can help us understand your content better by using uh, title tags and a meta description and the canonical links. So for instance, the dog Leica that we saw earlier on was the latest dog. So maybe I can go to slash like, doggosrating.com slash latest, and then I find Leica this week or the, for a couple of days because she's the latest dog that was added to the repository, right? But then I also can go to slash dog slash Leica to find her anytime. But maybe tomorrow at slash latest, there's another dog. Hmm. So which page should I be putting in the index? Because if, if someone searches for Leica and clicks on the first link that goes to slash latest and then sees Epona, then they're like, wait, this is not the dog I wanted. This is not the dog you're looking for. So tell us what is the URL that we should be indexing by giving us this canonical URL. That's one thing. Also give us a clear title. If all my pages had the title doggos rating or rate doggos, then people like Google goes like, what? I'm not so sure what I should be displaying here. If I just display like, if you say like, best doggos, and then you see 100 pages that say rate doggos, then you're like, uh, which one do I click? But if it says which dog this is about, then I'm like, ah, yeah, I like her. That's the one I liked, I think. Click. Much, much better for the user as well. And then you can give us a little description. Uh, we might display some of it. We might display it all. We might display something else, depending on what we find useful on the page. Uh, this little description appears below your title and gives the user a hint, like, ah, OK, cool, yeah. Leica is the best doggo, 11 of 10, cool. Yes, this, this sounds like something I want to click on. So this helps you getting users to your site, and it helps users identifying what might be a good result. So with these three simple HTML tags that have been around for pretty much ever, you can do a lot of good stuff, and you might get more users on your page, which is pretty good, I think. Also, please. Respect HTTP statuses. They exist for a reason. And what I mean by that is, 
Let's have a look. So I point my browser to fetch Lowell would know on my Doggo's rating page. And I see this and it says, I don't know. I'm not sure what you're trying to do, but whoopsies, I do not have this, sorry. And as a user, I'm like, oh, all right, yeah, there's nothing here. I go back. But if Googlebot does this, then um, we see that this gives it 200. 200 here means, OK, yes, cool, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the content. I have no content, but I give it to you anyways. So that's, that's not good. Because now we're like, ooh, what's going on here? So we give you this page as a user searching for something. You search for something, we're like, cool, yeah, this page said 200, all OK, cool, nice. Here it is, and then the user clicks something and goes like, oh, damn. And then we're like, oh, no, we are so sorry. Oh, my god. Oh, wow. Have a glass of water. Uh, sit down. Breathe in. Breathe out. It's going to be fine. So don't do this. This is called a soft 404, and we try to detect it. Uh, so we try to be clever in finding out if your content looks like this is a 404 page, but make it easier for us to use 404, so 404 as an HTTP code, or 410, which means gone. Um, they basically are identical as far as we are concerned, but use one of the HTTP codes that makes sense. Uh, also avoid sneaky 404. So here I click on puppies, and everything's fine, and then I reload the page. Whoops. Oh, no. Again, like, everything looks fine. Everything is great. I want puppers. Cool. Yeah, that works. So what's going on here? Hmm. So in this case, what happens is this application loads, and then JavaScript kicks in and takes over navigation and goes like, aha, you have moved there, so I just reload the, the content in place instead of like reloading the page. But then if I reload the page, there's no JavaScript that can do this. So now the server is asked, and the server goes, I do not know what you want. I'm not sure what's happening here. Sorry. So make sure for all your routes to serve your application. Even if it's a single page application, you have to make sure all routes work individually. Service workers can make this a little trickier, because imagine having a service worker. So if I go to the home page first, the service worker installs itself, and then I reload the page, and the service worker is being asked before going to the network, and the service worker goes, I know this, I serve the index HTML for this route, then it still looks like it would be working. But if someone else comes and clicks on this particular link, if I send this link via email or instant message or what's cool these days, Snapchat? I don't know. Um, uh, then, then the user does not have the service worker installed, so they see the 404. And the same goes for Googlebot. Googlebot in, basically pretends to be a new user, because that's what might happen. Someone searching for you, clicking on a link, getting a 404, not good. So make sure to serve your content on all routes. You can use URL rewriting if you have an old-fashioned server that does not do fancy things. Um, do not hijack 404 logic. So if you're using, for instance, GitHub pages, there's the possibility to do like custom 404 pages. But then you give us an HTTP 404, and we're like, oh, this page does not exist. Like, it's, it's not found. We're not going to index it. Make sure you give us a 200 uh, OK for the pages that actually exist, and you do not not serve them. OK. Uh, if you want to test this, always test in a fresh incognito window to make sure that there's no service workers or stuff going to these routes. OK, cool. Uh, last, well, like second to last one is something that is an enhancement. So if you have content that you're really, really proud of, so for instance, I'm really bad at baking and cooking, to be honest. I burned water. <laughs> is that physically possible? I don't think so. Did I do it? Hell yes, right? So um, I'm really bad at cooking. So if I get a recipe and that's just right and it's really tasty and nice, I want to share this with everyone. And I want to share it in the best way. So help bots and other, uh, other websites and crawlers understand that this is specific content. So we have a bunch of different things that we support. We support articles and books and events like this one. We support job postings. We support local businesses. Uh, reviews, recipes, videos, whatever. So if you have some content that is one of these categories, you can tell us explicitly about it. So we don't have to like try to find out if this is a recipe or something. It's like, OK, there's images and text, and it sounds like it might be a recipe. We are not sure about this. If you tell us this is a recipe and it's the best apple pie ever, and we're like, aha, this is a recipe. This is good to know. Um, and you do this like that. So you add a little bit of additional markup. 
And this is called JSON LD, linked data JSON. And here we say, like, yeah, so this is a recipe here. And this is the apple pie my grandma used to make. And here's an example image of this. And uh, here's a description. It's just like the best apple pie ever. And then I can add additional things like how long it takes to prepare it, how did users like it, is there like user reviews, or um, which ingredients do I need, or how do I prepare it step by step, and all these kind of things I can add here. And this is not com something coming from us. We are not like inventing something new here. This is an open standard called, called well, the recipe uh, JSON uh, data standard from schema.org. Schema.org is an open community. If you haven't heard it, check it out, um, where people are discussing how to express data semantically on the internet. Uh, has been around for a couple of years. It's really cool. Uh, highly recommend doing it. Because if you give us this kind of data, we can show it in a highlighted way. It doesn't mean that we're always doing it. We have a few criteria, like, is this really a good recipe? Is this something that people would like to? But then if we know that it's good, then we show you, like, here's the apple pie by grandma from example.com. Uh, there's 7,400 reviews. I don't know how many people actually ate it later on, but OK, that's cool. And 4.8 is totally underrated. Like, absolutely. It's actually a 6 out of 5, if you ask me. But I am biased. It's my grandma. Uh, it has 512 calories, and it takes 1 hour and 30 minutes to prepare. Uh, if you're me, it takes 3 hours to prepare, but they are, well, that's what happens. So we, get, we give you this highlighting for free if you tell us more about your content. Also, we have a few tools that you might or might not know um, that you can use to, oh, my battery is dying. Thank you, Marion. A round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Damn those computers. Back in my days, computers ran for ages, as long as they were plugged in. Um, anyhow, because you couldn't carry them, they're like, what do you have there? My laptop. <laughs> right? So anyway, uh, we have a bunch of tools that you may or may not know about that help you test if you're doing fine and if you could improve something. So one of the first tests is the mobile-friendly test. You just give us a URL. And we analyze it, and we show you, yeah, this is mobile friendly. This could be, this works well on mobile. But also, we give you a screenshot of what we see when we go to your page. So here we see, like, yeah, this is looking good. This looks like the I/O event page. That's that's pretty cool. But maybe you just get a blank screen, and then what do you do? Oh no! Well, the cool thing is we have two things that help you then in this case. Or if, if this looks odd or wrong, right? If Google sees your page weirdly, then you can have a look at the source code at the HTML we see when rendering. So that's what we get after JavaScript, sorry, after JavaScript execution. So you can see like, oh, this is missing an href, whoopsies, right? And we give you the JavaScript console log. So you can quickly check your site to see how Googlebot sees your page. And this is not like some fake thing. This is the actual thing. This is what we would be seeing on your page. And uh, you get the console logs for free, so everything that happens if you ship us. So Googlebot runs, any, any guesses for the Chrome version that we are running in Googlebot? 40 something is actually pretty good. It's like, I think it's 41. So we are running a Chrome that is, um, uh, a little older, like two years old. Do not try this at home. We don't have ES6 in Googlebot right now. So if you serve us untranspired JavaScript and you rely on it rendering your page, then you might see a blank page. But if you then go to the JavaScript console, you see like unknown reserved keyword const, and you're like, oh, dang, OK, that's good to know. So you can use this to test your page really quickly. Um, and it's a, it's a great thing. If you want to try it out, you can go to g.co slash mobile friendly. Um, or if you search for mobile friendly test in Google, it, the search bar turns into a URL input field, and then you can put your uh, URL in and try it right from the search uh, results. Another cool tool, if you want to do structured data, is the structured data testing tool. It's basically like a little text, uh, actually a large text input field on one side and the results on the other side. So you could put, like, you could put your, your uh, JSON LD in and see if we actually detect it properly and if it's valid. Um, or you could just give us a URL, and if you give us a URL, we show you what kind of structured data we are seeing for this URL. So that's pretty good as well. Um, so you can use that to verify if your structured data is correct and is being seen by Google, which is what you want to know. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a short link, so it's search.google.com slash structured data slash testing tool, or just search for structured data testing tool on Google, and you'll find the tool as well. Last but not least, my favorite, my secret super weapon, 
uh, is called Search Console. It used to be called Webmaster Tools, but has been changed dramatically since. So Search Console is the thing where you verify yourself for your page that you actually own the domain. And then once we know that you own this domain, we help you keep an eye on how you're doing. So you don't even have to go to the Search Console and check every couple of days, because if there is a problem, we're going to send you an email. This is nice. You don't even have to like, worry about it. You get an email saying, like, hey, there's a problem. These pages have dropped out of the index. And you're like, oh, no. We deployed something yesterday, and that might be why. So let's have a look which pages dropped out and why. Um, you see all the search queries that people have been using to come to your page. So you basically get analytics, but for people who might come to your page. And you see how often people actually click on them and how often we show your website for a certain query, so you can do some optimizations in the content. Maybe you'll find out your product is called Curl Master 5000, but people are basically search for the weird thing from the TV ads. So you might actually want to go like, Curl Master 5000, AKA the weird thing from the TV ads. And then people are like, oh, yeah, this is the thing. Yes, this is right. Click and buy, which is great. Uh, what was it called? Uh, Plumbus, yeah, Plumbus. The, this is the Plumbus. It's the thing that solves all problems. Um, and you get the warnings as well. So if there is any problems, you see them in the reports. So here we see like we have 328 pages that have some issues there. We might want to have a look at what's going on here and why this is happening and what we can do to fix it. Uh, it gives you an over overview of the pages that we have in the index and those that we do not have in the index and why we do not have them in the index. Uh, if you're using AMP, it gives you a report on those pages as well. So how often are they being clicked? How often are they being shown? Are they valid? All these kind of things. Um, and if you want to try that out, you can go to g.co slash search console. It also now contains a new thing, which is called the single URL inspection tool. Um, basically, you can put any of your URLs that are in, within the do uh, domain that you verified for. Um, and we show you if it's in the index, or if not, why it's not in the index. So it's a debug tool that shows you very well exactly what's happening. You don't have to guess anymore. OK, let me quickly summarize this. So please do pay attention to good URLs, because they are very, very important for your users as well as for crawlers. Uh, use meaningful markup. HTML has a bunch of tags for a good reason. So please do use them reasonably. Do not make everything a div. That's not a good idea. Um, also use correct HTTP statuses, because they mean something. So these meaningful information uh, can actually help uh, browsers as well as, as crawlers. Um, if you have data that might be highlighted, um, definitely use the structured data tool because it's used, super useful. Um, and it can also give you things like, I'm not sure if they're picking it up, but voice assistants sometimes use this information as well. So you definitely want to get in there as well. Uh, and we have a few tools. Get to know them. Try them out. Take them for a spin. Give us feedback on them because we want to improve the tools for you. That's literally what I'm here for. We want to hear if the tools we are putting out make sense to you and how we can improve them to help you more with your job. And last but not least, do not do weird stuff for the search engines. Do good stuff for the users, and we do the rest. OK? Um, quickly, thanks and shouts out to everyone who gave me permission to use their doc pictures, and obviously the wonderful dogs that were, uh, were associated with these lovely, lovely people. Um, thanks to my coworkers who helped me compile this presentation and gave me a lot of insight because I basically just started three months ago. So these people really, really helped me. Awesome folks, all of them. And uh, thank you very much for listening to me and having me here. And please come find me and talk to me or talk to me on Twitter if you're shy. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs>